I'm going to get into it tonight. I can tell all of you, uh, if you were here last week, um, I made the announcement that we started a series last week called Difficult People. Don't look at your neighbor right now. But difficult people is what we're talking about. Last week we talked about needy people. Needy people. And then I told you that this week we were going to talk about manipulators. So I see all of you manipulated somebody into coming with you tonight. And we're going to talk about manipulators tonight. And, and I'm going to try to help you from the word of the Lord. Um, so so let, me, let me see a show of hands as we get going here. And I, I promise I'll use scripture uh, as we get going. I'm not just going to talk from my own uh, thoughts. I'll use scripture but just let me kind of get into a little bit of it here. But let, let me see a show of hands. How many of you know somebody at some point in your life who tried to control you, manipulate you, or impose their will on you? Come on. You know. Come on. Come on. Come on. Raise, raise both hands. Raise both hands. Come on. Raise them high. Raise them high. Raise them high. Yeah. See, I wanted to see if I could control you. Y'all did good. Y'all did. Y'all did good. Yeah, y'all did real good. Um, I'm just kidding, but there, there's an old joke that says, it kind of goes like this, that um, supposedly in heaven there's going to be two lines, and you've got to get in one of those lines, and St. Peter is the one that's going to monitor the lines. Remember, this is just an old joke, but one line has a sign that says, this line is for men who are controlled by their wives. And under that sign, as far as the eye can see, men are lined up under that sign. And then on the other side, there's a sign that says, this sign is for men who are not controlled by their wives. And there's one guy, <laughs> one guy standing under this sign. And so Peter recognizes, man, there's a great disparity here. And he sees all these people lined up under the ones that are controlled, and then there's this one guy standing under the sign that says he's not controlled. And Peter walks up to him and said, what are you doing uh, standing under this sign? And the guy, the guy just said, I don't know, man. My wife just told me to shut up and stand over here in this line and not to ask any questions. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be all right tonight, I think. I'm going to get spiritual here in a minute. Hang on. So, so what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes is how, how do we deal with those manipulative and controlling people in our lives? And we've got to recognize that this has been a problem. Manipulation has been a problem since the dawn of time. Uh, if, you, if, if they can get, get for me Mark chapter 6, I'm going to kind of move quickly. But if you, if you go to Mark chapter 6... It says Herodias' chance finally came on Herod's birthday and he gave a party for his high government officials, army officers and the leading citizens of Galilee. And then his daughter, also named Herodias, came in and performed a dance that greatly pleased Herod and his guests. And now I don't know what kind of dance she performed, but it must have been like off the chart. I mean, it was a knockout dance. Whatever, whatever she did, I'm not sure what she did. But she, she performed a dance so inspiring that Herod says, you, you can ask me for anything you like, the king told the girl, and I'm going to give it to you. He even vowed, I will give you whatever. Think about, think about what kind of dance she had to do. I'll give you up to half of my kingdom, right? So she went out and she asked her mother, what should I ask for? And her mother told her, ask for the head of John the Baptist. So the girl hurried back to the king and told him, I want the head of John the Baptist right now on a tray. See, some of y'all think the Bible's boring. It's all in the Bible. Then the king deeply regretted what he had said. But because of the vows that he had made in front of his guests, he couldn't refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner to the prison to cut John's head and to bring it to him. And the soldier beheaded John in the prison. Amen? So that passage of Scripture, it shows 
two different women in the New Testament who manipulated and controlled this king, Herod. And, you know, I, I realized that there was probably, there, there's a lot to learn from this story. They, these women controlled and manipulated this king, but the circumstances that they were able to do that under were, were the fact that uh, the king was throwing a big bash, a big party. I'm, I'm sure that they got intoxicated because how many of you understand that people who aren't in their right mind do things that are outside? When you introduce foreign things into your system and it, 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 it leaves you in a place and to where you're not making good decisions and, and here... Here it is, and I'm sure the party's gone on. Everybody's full of wine. Everybody's feeling good. They're feeling no pain for the moment. He's going to be the big shot. He's impressed with this girl and the dance that she's done. I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom. And he, what he didn't understand was about to happen was he was about to be put in a position that because of his position as king, he was not going to be able to back out of because he opened his mouth, made a vow in front of all of his high government officials. And so because there were some people that hated John the Baptist, that's what they wanted. They wanted his head on a plate, on a platter. And now then he's going to be obligated to do that. He said, so, so he said it publicly, you promised it, we want it. And and he ended up doing something that he didn't want to do. And he took the life of John the Baptist all behind manipulation and control. Being manipulated, being controlled. So then if you, and you don't have to go there, but if you, if you remember and you go back to the Old Testament and you get in the book of Genesis, somewhere around the 25th chapter, you can begin to read about two brothers, a guy named Jacob, a guy named Esau. Esau's the older brother who had the birthright. Jacob was the younger brother uh, who, who, was, who got mad because his uh, older brother had the birthright and, and comes a day they grow up and Esau goes hunting. He killed some meat. He comes home and he's been hunting all day. And he tells, uh, when he walks into the camp or to the place where their home is, he tells his mother and brother that he's hungry. And Jacob, the younger brother, was cooking up this uh, bowl of stew. And, and the older brother said, I, I'm so hungry, I'm about to die. Give me some. And Jacob says, I'll give you some. But you're going to have to give me your birthright before I'll give you any of this stew. And listen, and oh, this all works in so well to what we're starting tomorrow. Because Esau was so overcome with his own appetites that he was willing to sell the thing that meant the most in his life to satisfy himself in a moment. Is anybody still with me? And he said, so you've got to give me your birthright. And, the, and Jacob ended up cornering Esau into a power play. He tricked his brother out of the birthright. And manipulation and control were at work again in the story of Jacob and Esau. And maybe one of the most tragic biblical examples of manipulation uh, is, is the story of Delilah. You remember Delilah in the Old Testament? She manipulated Samson. And if you don't know who Samson is, Samson was the strong guy in the scripture. He had strength that was somehow connected to the, to the vow that he took as a, a, a Nazarite not to shave his hair or not to cut his hair. And he was an enemy of the Philistines. The Philistines wanted to kill him and he had a lust problem. He always wanted uh, women from, from another culture, women from, uh, that, that he was not in covenant with. And, and he, he became seduced by this uh, lady named Delilah who was was uh, in, in cahoots with the Philistines and now then she begins to seduce him more and she begins to talk to him sweetly and, and begins to try to uncover the secret of his strength because Samson had destroyed so many Philistines in his life and, and over and over again you can just hear the story if you read the story in the book of Judges you hear Delilah you know you hear her hey big boy Do I need to do it in that voice or just stay in the voice? I'm... <laughs> hey, big boy, what's your secret? What's your secret, big boy? If I'd have thought this out better, I'd, I'd, have, had, I'd have been up here with Rosanna and my head laying in her lap and, <laughs> and her saying, hey, big boy. <laughs> hey, big boy. <laughs> Come on, babe, let's do that now while we... (laughs) 
Y'all didn't know any of that was in the Bible and you thought church was boring too. You can have a good time at church. But Delilah, she keeps trying to seduce him to find out where his power is coming from. And over and over and over again, it doesn't work and he keeps tricking her. But she was persistent and she didn't give up. And I think they've got for me Judges chapter 16, uh, verse number 15, I, I think. Delilah pouted. She pouted. She puckered out that bottom lip and she pouted. <laughs> and she said, how can you tell me I love you? Come on, come on. Th- just, uh, just close your eyes and think about this for a minute. Some of you heard this. How can you tell me you love me when you won't share your secrets? <laughs> come on, come on. It's manipulation at its best. And she's all hurt. And when, Samson, you've made fun of me three times now. Still haven't told me what makes you so strong. Now watch. I love this part because the Bible just gets real. And it says, she tormented him with her nagging. It's in the Bible. (laughs) Watch. She tormented him. She nagged him so much till he was sick to death. And keep moving. And finally, I'm just sick to death of being nagged. And finally, Samson shared his secret with her. And he said, my hair's never been cut. He confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me. And I would become as weak as anyone else. And Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth. So she sent for the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, she said, for he's finally told me a secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with money in their hands. And Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with her head, with his head in her lap. And then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. And in this way, she began to bring him down and his strength left him. You with me? She began to bring him down and his strength left him. She manipulated. Did you see the manipulation there? You don't love me. If you loved me, you'd share your secrets with me. Manipulate, 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 manipulate. Uh, uh, Jacob, uh, you're not going to get what I have until I can have what I want. Manipulate, manipulate, manipulate. Come on, somebody. So what we see is all through the Bible, it's a real common problem. And I know some of you are like... Larry's too much nonsense. Listen, you've got to laugh at some of this stuff because what I'm about to tell you is going to be hard to swallow. But a lot of this, a lot of this, it's a real common problem. And we, we have a little bit of fun with it, but tragically in our lives today, oftentimes, many of you sitting right in here, we allow people that sometimes are trying to hurt us and sometimes there are people that feel like they have our best interest at heart and yet one way or another, they corner us and they start to pull our strings and they control us and we end up surrendering the direction of our lives. Listen to what I'm about to say. We end up surrendering the direction of our lives to someone else other than God. And it happens through manipulation. How, how do manipulators work? I'm going to give it to you. Three main ways that they work. The first is flattery. And it's flattery where you try to get what you want. Man, if, if, if people, listen, you all know, come on, everybody in here works a job. You, you, you know, there's always that one person at the office, that brown noser. Hello? Listen, listen, listen. At this church, there's only one person in the office. (laughs) Can you guess who it is? Don't worry, she's over there. (laughs) But there's always that one person that, man, every time the boss comes around there, sweet talking to boss. Man, that was a great presentation you made there, sir, yesterday, sir. Awesome. I'm on board 100%, sir. Yeah. Happens in churches, too, to pastors. Pastor, that was the greatest sermon I ever heard. We're right behind you. Yeah, pull that knife out of my back while you're back there. 
manipulate. And people flatter you to manipulate you because they believe by flattery they can get what they want. Come on, you still with me? So flattery is a way that people do it. I'm just going to hit these quick because I'm going to talk about some other things. But one of the more common tactics that manipulators use, they, they not only use flattery, but they use threats. And, and when, they, when they threaten people, it goes on and on and on and on. Come on, we see this all the time. Listen, you, you know what abusive relationships are? It's manipulation. It's exactly what it is. It's manipulation. People who are abusers in relationships, they manipulate the other person by threatening them. Come on, we just had, right here in the United States of America, just in the last week, there's a man sentenced to 140 years in prison for untold numbers of sexual assaults on young girls trying to become gymnasts. And the questions that everybody wants to ask is, how could that go on for so long and with so many and nobody know? Do you know that one of those girls' dads committed suicide because she told her dad what was happening and her dad did not believe her and then when it all started coming out the weight of that was too much for him and he he took his own life because he couldn't he couldn't stand the fact that his daughter came to him and and he didn't believe what she was trying to tell him because what happens is people that have control in situations like that don't tell anybody don't say anything about this i'll i'll hurt you i'll hurt your family i'll do that because people manipulate they use threats i'm making sense you still with me so, so we flatter people to manipulate them. We threaten people to manipulate them. And this is probably one that a lot of you will understand real quickly. We also use guilt. Every parent in here. <laughs> uses guilt to manipulate your children. I'm, I'm coming at you, parents. Hang on. You know... Your mom makes you feel guilty. (laughs) Some of your moms have a master's degree in guilt, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I mean, they, they know how to lay it on. They know how to lay it on. I I was talking to somebody the other day and, and I was telling them, it's not just parents. Children know how to manipulate. I was talking to somebody the other day who's, who, who they missed out on some things in their kid's life when they were growing up because of choices and stuff they made. And, 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 and now then, that relationship, it's, it's being healed and things are going well. But this person told me, they said, uh, there's things that I do for them now because I feel guilty And listen, don't think that your adult children are not smart enough to pick up on that. (laughs) I'll ride this gravy train. (laughs) Hello? And and so we'll use we'll use guilt. And you you know, if if you loved me, you'd really do this for me. But obviously you don't love me. Because if you loved me. Roseanne and I just play around with one another a lot, but there's nights I'll I'll say, she'll she'll tell me. I love you, and I, you know, you're supposed to come back and be like, I love you too, babe. She'll, she'll, we're getting ready to go to bed and go to sleep, and she's, I love you. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> and what are you talking about? No, you don't, you don't love me. And we're just playing with each other, messing around. But how many of you know there are real relationships where people operate like that? Yeah. You, you don't love me. If you, if you love me, If you loved me, the yard would have been mowed six weeks ago. If you loved me, this remodel of this house that you started three years ago would be done. (laughs) If you loved me, this. If you loved me, that. And so they do do things like that to make you feel guilty. And and so we'll we'll use that kind of thing. We'll use bribery, threats, guilt. And a lot of people who are otherwise pretty decent people will work their way in and sometimes knowingly but often uh, uh, unknowingly they'll grab the strings of your life and they'll start 
leading you into a dance that you don't need to be dancing. So what do we do? I'm not just going to give you the problem. I'm going to try to give you some real solution here tonight. So what do we do when we recognize that somebody's trying to manipulate us? Somebody's trying to control us. How, how do I break the power of manipulation and control in my life? And last week, if you remember, we talked about those overly needy people, and I gave you three prayers to pray when you're dealing with overly needy people. I'm going to do the same thing here tonight. I'm going to give you three different prayers that you can pray when you're dealing with manipulative people in your life. Because listen, it's really important when you start dealing with people and start trying to break the chains of control and manipulation in your life, that you be led by the Spirit of God in your relationships. Because what you don't want to do is just try to impose your will and do what you think is right. But we really want to begin to ask God to give us direction and wisdom when we're dealing with those controlling issues in our families, on our jobs, with our kids, whatever the situation may be. So if you're writing things down, you can write this down. The, num- the prayer number one uh, that, that you need to pray if you're dealing with people who manipulate. You want to pray like this, God, help me to recognize. This is just simple stuff. I'm not, I'm not, it's not rocket science. I'm just trying to give you some guidelines. But that first prayer is, God, help me recognize when somebody is trying to manipulate me. Help me to recognize it. Because listen, let's be truthful here. There's a lot of us, and I'm, I'm dealing, all this difficult people series is all about relationships. And I know some of you are like, man, Larry, there's, there's better things we need to be hearing. No, we need to be hearing this stuff right here because some of the dysfunctional relationships that you're involved in is what's jamming up the flow of the grace and power of God in your life. And until you unclog that, it's going to be jammed up in your life. And, and here's the deal. Why, why should I pray to, be, to, to help me recognize when somebody's trying to manipulate me? Because a lot of us have been uh, in our own dysfunction so long that we've got others that just play us and then we play along and we don't even recognize that it's just a very unhealthy place for us to be in our life. They lead and we follow. We don't even recognize maybe that they're threatening us or they're making us feel guilty or they're leading us into things that are not in our best best interest or leading us into things that aren't for the glory of God. How many of you understand that God has a preferred future for your life, but he will not force you to go there. You've got to make your way there uh, by following his voice and not the voice of other people in your life. And I, I want to show you this. There's a really, really uh, interesting story in, in the scripture that, and I've used this chapter a lot here lately, but Jesus is opening up to his disciples about what's about to happen to him. He was getting really vulnerable. And he takes that inner circle of guys with him. And he begins to tell them, the ones that he's been doing life with, and he begins to tell them, the reason that I came, the reason I was born, the reason I'm here, my purpose is, I'm just going to lay all this out, guys. I've got to give my life, and and they're going to beat me. It's going to get ugly. I'm going to be... I'm going to be beaten and spit on and and it's going to be a nasty scene. But I'm doing this because the Father sent me and my purpose has to be fulfilled. And it's for you that I'm going to go through all of this and give my life. But don't, don't worry, I'm going to be raised again. Resurrection's coming. We talked about it Sunday. Don't get stuck at the cross. Calvary's not the end of the story. There's resurrection life. Resurrection life's coming. So, so guys, listen to what I'm saying. This, this, is, this is what I want you to know. I'm about to have to go through all this. And he's, he's really having a heart-to-heart talk with them. And he's telling them from his heart what's about to happen. Now watch this. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 21 and 22. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But Peter, watch this. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. He said, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. Watch this. The scripture says, Peter took him aside. (laughs) 
Let me, let me give you a sign. One of the first things that manipulators want to do is isolate you from others. Peter took Jesus aside and began to tell him. Now listen, Peter's not, Peter was not a bad guy. And Peter really loved Jesus. And Peter thought that what he was telling Jesus, he th- I- I'm sure he thought, man, he was going to get a pat on the back. Thanks for your loyalty, Peter. Man, I appreciate that. I appreciate you standing up for me. But Jesus turns around and tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because Jesus understood that, that Peter was in his flesh and Peter was trying to manipulate Jesus out of his position that would lead him to his purpose. Thank you. And what you've got to recognize in your life is when people, listen, anytime people start wanting to whisper to you, anytime people start wanting to pull you away from the crowd, so to speak, anytime people start wanting to pull you away from those that love you and those that care about you and try to get you out isolated and separated it's usually because manipulation is involved because they have a different agenda and most of the time their agenda is standing in the way of God's agenda for your life and what you need to do is look at those people don't call them Satan I mean I have called my trainer that from time to time but you need to look at those people and say you're standing in the way Of the direction that God has for my life. Don't you know? Listen, Jesus didn't call Peter Satan because he didn't like Peter. Jesus just understood there was a spirit rising in Peter that was opposed to the purpose that God had for his life. Am I making any sense? And see, what happened? Let me say this. Why, why do manipulators want to isolate you? Because manipulators lose their power when there's a crowd. What are y'all talking about? <laughs> Two of them just having their own conversation, huh? But manipulators lose their power when they get in a crowd. Listen, that's why most most of most of the time, abusers do their dirty work in private. Because I guarantee you, if some guy listen, now don't any of you boneheads try this. But if some guy comes dragging a woman in here by the hair of her head, slapping her around, I guarantee you, I can just guarantee you, I can guarantee you, at least at the refuge, somebody's going to get up. And that old boy's probably going to leave with a mark or two. Right? (laughs) Because the deal is, he, he knows that He can't come in a crowd and do that, but he can get in private and work his evil, his ill will. Manipulators are the same way. They'll, they'll, listen, man, you gotta be careful, especially in churches. Especially in churches. When people invite you for coffee and they invite you, just the two of you, and the first thing they do after they sit down and put their sugar in their coffee, which they can't do for the next three weeks. (laughs) So everybody ought to be safe in here. (laughs) But, but, But when the first thing they do is sit you down and say, I just need to be talking to you about some things that are happening at the refuge. That is an act of manipulation. Because they've gotten you off privately. If they were really concerned about the refuge... Ain't nobody talking to me, it's all right. I got more notes, so we'll just go on. Hallelujah. Manipulators lose their power in groups. So he takes him aside, does all of that kind of stuff. Don't let people do that to you in your life. Don't let them do that. 
How many of you understand this, that most of the time, manipulation doesn't come from people who don't like us. Most of the time it comes from people who say or claim or do like us or love us. Because it's hard for somebody who you don't have any interest in being around to manipulate you. The people closest to you are the ones who can manipulate you the best. That's why parents are good at manipulating their children. Right? We can, man, we can do it so well. Listen, I have two children. I became a master manipulator. I know with my son for certain. Listen, with my son, all in the name of trying to, what I thought was offer help, I manipulated. Oh, I'm, y'all going to leave me hanging out here today like I'm the only one. Yeah. I, I manipulated. <laughs> because, you know, we, you do think, just like Jacob and Esau, when they start behaving in certain ways, what you start doing is going into manipulation. Well, if you're going to continue to live here, this, 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 and this, right? Come on, come on. Come on, all you manipulators, come on. You know it's the truth. Or I, I'll tell you what. Watch this. Man, this is, this is... I'll buy you a car if you'll move home and get off those drugs. Man, you just became every addict's hero. Because all they have to do is say yes and move home a few days and they got a new car. And then you start manipulating. If you don't, if you don't straighten up, then I'm going to take that car away. And we try to manipulate. My, our, uh, right? Anybody ever been manipulated? Don't raise your hand. I'm just kidding. We, tr- we, try, to, we try to do all of those things. And so... You know, Peter, hey, Jesus, I love you. I don't want you to die. Peter had good intentions, but he was standing between Jesus and the Father's will for Jesus. And what you've got to determine is when people are trying to manipulate you, because it could be, even if they have good intentions, that that person is standing between you and God's will for your life. So you need to pray that you can recognize when somebody's trying to manipulate you. Don't allow people... Listen. I I know I'm walking slow tonight, but I'm trying to give you some good stuff. Uh, I've, I've, I've learned a lot of lessons through life and ministry, I've learned a lot of hard lessons. <laughs> and before I, before I really got rock solid in who I am and who he is and what I can do and what I can Listen, I'm just going to tell you all this right now. If I wasn't confident in my identity in Christ and know my place and my position, I would go crazy pastoring this church. Because in a previous life, I would feel guilty all the time because when people don't get it or when people do harm or whatever, I would take that stuff personal and feel like I'm the one that has to do something because I've got to be their savior. One of the greatest things that ever happened to my ministry was when I realized he's God and I'm not. Come on. And and if I spend my whole life, and some of you, some of you... Listen, this happened to me as a parent. I had to come to the place. Listen, I had to come to the place to where I understood that I could not solve all of my children's problems. What can I do? I can pray for them. I can love them. I can be there for them when they need me to be there for them. But I, and I, I can do what I can do. But there are some things that I don't have the power to do. And I can't spend the rest of my life being made to feel guilty because there are things that I don't have control over and I can't do anything about. I am not God for them. There are some things that they're going to have to work out between God and themselves. Am I making any sense here tonight? 
And so it, you, you've got to get to the place to where, you, you know, that you, you don't feel like that you're everybody's savior. And you can't feel guilty because somebody made a choice or made a decision. And now you feel bad because you feel like you let them down. If I'd only been there, if I'd only said this, if I'd only done that. Listen, people are going to do. My dad says that people are like 900 pound gorillas. They're going to do what they want to do. And what you have to do is recognize when they're trying to manipulate you, you can't take that guilt in and feel it on yourself. Quit allowing other people to make you dance to the wrong music. So the second prayer. The second prayer that you're going to have to pray real simply. The first one has helped me to recognize. And the second one is, God, give me the power and give me the courage. and Give me the will and the resolve to put healthy boundaries in place. And then to stick to those boundaries. What some of us need to do is begin to redefine the boundaries in our lives. You don't have to be a rude jerk. But you can just rise to a place in your life to where you say, Okay, I'm not that person anymore. That's not who I am anymore. I mean no disrespect to you. But I'm drawing a different boundary. Where you've been able to encroach, I'm not going to be able to allow you to do that any longer. This is not about you. This is about me. This is about me developing as a person. This is about me developing as a believer. Listen, man, there are people, listen, ah, there are people when, when, and, and some of you that are kind of new, people, people will, oh, so now you're one of those Christians. Now you, now you're, oh, now you're into the Christian thing. Well, you know, a Christian would do this. And a, listen, don't let people, that's manipulation. Don't let people put that on you. As you grow in Christ and as you grow in understanding, who you are. You have the right and the responsibility to put boundaries in your life that do not allow other people to come in and shift you toward what they want for your life instead of what He wants for your life. You'll never, you'll never put a bigger boundary in place than what Jesus did with Peter. Peter. Peter said, I'm not going to let you die, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus turned around and said, what? <laughs> Get behind me, Satan. He said, Peter, you're a stumbling block to me. You don't have the mind of God in this thing. So here's what you do. Here's what you do. All you grown children, the next time you're parent is trying to manipulate them mani manipulate you you just look at your mom and say get behind me satan no i'm teasing i'm teasing i'm teasing don't you dare do that that'll be the only thing that makes the video tonight that'll be the only thing no you don't have to do that listen what you have to do man your grandma's trying to manipulate you. Man, and listen, parent, don't you call your grandma. <laughs> Parents are terrible about this with, uh, with, with money. We manipulate our children with money. And it's a way of control. And, you, and let me just say this to you. If you do that with your children, what you are doing is you are limiting your children's potential and their future. Because they'll never rise to be what God has ordained them to be while you're trying to keep them and make them what you want them to be. Woo, Larry, that is good preaching. I know, man, that's awesome, yeah. You've got to understand that other people, even people you love, can be a stumbling block to you. And they're leading you to things that hurt you and don't help you. My kids, you know, they've got young kids. Asher's, he, he turned three. He's getting to that age where <laughs> Gabby sent me a text this morning. And she said, I know Lorelai never will do anything like this. Sweet little Lorelai. But Gabby sent me a text this morning. She said, you know what this kid just told me? 
talking about Asher. And I said, what? And he, she said, he told me, told me that I needed to get up and go to Walmart and buy him some chocolate milk. <laughs> and I said, well, what, why are you still at the house then? And she said, I'm trying to figure out who told him he was boss. I said, he came here like that. You know, he came, he came here like that. But he's getting at that age, you know, where he can, be, he can start demanding things. If he doesn't get the things the way he wants, he's kind of going through a spell right now where if he doesn't get exactly what he wants, he's standing there and going, ah! And they're, they're doing a great job, you know. But you just have to get to the place. Man, if your kid, <laughs> if your kid is the one that everybody can hear in Walmart, You don't buy them candy to hush them up. They've just manipulated you and they're three. What you do is say you can scream from now till Jesus returns. I'm going to finish my shopping. You're not getting any candy here. You're not getting any candy at home. In fact, I think I'll take all the candy for the next 21 days. How do you like that? How do you like that? And I'm setting boundaries. You're not going to manipulate. I'm helping somebody. Y'all just not acting like it. If you're in relationship with people, listen, if you're if married, unmarried, if people start putting this stuff on you, well, you know what? I'm going to hang up on you because you don't. You better text me back right now. You, whatever they're doing, it's manipulation. And if, listen, if you're not married and you're in that kind of relationship, you need out of it right now. Right now. Right now. It ain't going to get better when you say, I do. Ain't nobody talking to Larry tonight. You, that's manipulation. It's control. And God didn't design you to be controlled by other people. He, he designed you to be led by the Spirit of God. Right, am I doing okay? i got to hurry. If you work at a place where the only way that they can operate is to continually threaten you, I wonder what would happen if some people got bold enough to just say, you know what, I'm tired of living in that kind of circumstance. And I tell you what, sir, with all due respect, you're just going to have to go ahead and follow through on that threat. Not. <laughs> Any of the one talking to y'all over there. That blessing box better be open tomorrow or else. I'm telling you. <laughs> but what you have to do is you have to begin to redefine your relationships and you have to take power back. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. There's manipulation in every area of life. Manipulation in, in your home, among your children, with your husband, with your wife, with your extended family. There's manipulation at school. There's manipulation on your job. But you have to be the one to set boundaries. And let me tell you something. I know you don't want to hear this. But, but <clears throat> there are a lot of people who have been manipulated spiritually. And here at the refuge, we're not here to manipulate you spiritually. I'm not here to get, listen to me. I know some of you don't like this and you, you, you think that I'm way out and that I'm way liberal and, and, and all. I met with some people today. <laughs> I, this, it took me a while. This dawned on me after I left my meeting. But I met with some people today and they, it was a great meeting. And, and when I left, we're out in the parking lot leaving and they said, Oh, by the way, Pastor Larry, what do you drive? I thought that was an odd question. And uh, I said, well, I drive, I have a little Dodge Caliber five-speed little car. Oh, we took you for a Prius guy. <laughs> I didn't think about that till I got in the car and started driving off. They think I'm a tree hugger is what it is. <laughs> they, they've heard I'm liberal and they think I'm a tree hugger. And I know people make all kind of opinions about, 
me and my preaching. And Listen, you know nothing about me, I'm telling you. You know what you see here on Sundays and Wednesdays, you know. You... So you can make assumptions all you want, but don't, don't, don't get lost in your assumptions. But I know that people think that, that I'm, I'm too soft and I'm this and I'm that and the other. But listen to me. I don't believe as a pastor. My, my job is to speak the word of God. My job is to bring you to an encounter with Jesus Christ. I've already told you, I'm not God. I can't save you. It's not my job. Listen, there are people in this church that are involved in all kinds of things that I disagree with. But if I believe that what I'm seeing has, or saying has the power to change them, then this is right where they need to be because how can they hear without the gospel being preached? And if I stop trying to be God and manipulate them to do what I think they should do, and I just preach and allow the Holy Spirit to do what He can do, then people on their own without spiritual manipulation can arrive at a place with an encounter and a relationship with God that will make a difference in their lives. So help me recognize when somebody's trying to manipulate me, give me power to have good boundaries, and number three, watch this. This is going to hit you right, right between the eyes. Number three, God, help me to see my own need to control and be willing to surrender everything to you. God, help me to see my own need to control and manipulate and surrender everything to you. Because listen, while I've been sitting here talking about different kinds of people, I could see it in some of your faces. That's right. That's right. Whew. I hope my husband's listening to this tonight. I hope my, ooh, my mom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download this and send it to my mom. That's manipulation. And while, while we're sitting here thinking about who, who needs this message, whoo, we're looking around, so-and-so should have been here tonight. You're the ones that are here. You must need it. Hello? Because while I can get lost talking about other people, you and I, me, Larry, I'm the one. Listen, I can't speak on behalf, but I can tell you this about me. I have a deep, ungodly desire to control some things. And God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. And I believe he loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. But one of the things that's been hardest for me as a pastor is to give up the control of preaching to you what I want you to do in favor of what he wants for your life. Am I making any sense? Listen, she's not in here right now. I don't know where she's at. But in my marriage, I want to be in control. I, I want Rosanna to do what I want her to do. Come on, I do. Leland and I were trying to schedule a, a meeting for today, and he said, I got this, and I said, I got this, and... We got this, and, and no, no time would work. And he said, I, I'm paraphrasing, but something along the lines of stupid work. Work messes everything up. And I told him, I sent him a message back, and I said, hey, man, hey, let's quit. We have rich wives. <laughs> he can show you that. <laughs> I said that. Our wives aren't rich. But I'd like to be in control. Come on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, I'd really like everything to go. Listen, I want my kids to do what I want them to do. Let me tell you, one of the most difficult things is to be a, an adult parent or a parent of adults. And they get married and start making choices and decisions. And then they start having babies and making choices and decisions. And I'm just like... <laughs> Why? Because I want them to do... What I want them to do. There's things I'd like to be in control of. All of you, you're, you're acting like that doesn't happen, but it does. 
Listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being vulnerable with you. I want my wife to do what I want her to do. I want my kids to do what I want them to do. And I want you to do what I want you to do. I want this church. I want to be in control of this thing. Because I'm tired of people talking about me as the pastor of all of you. I want y'all to straighten up, fly right, come correct. But every Sunday I keep coming back to the, to the reality that there's things that I can't control. Every day my phone rings and I realize there's things I can't control. Sometimes my heart breaks and I realize there's things I can't control. So what do you do? Do you come in here and try to manipulate people? Or do you just come in here and tell people, I love you. I love you. But more than me, he loves you. And he's got a plan for your life. And, and I think I know what would work for a lot of you. But even in good intentions, I could be a stumbling block between you and what God really has for your life. So I want to get out of the way because as a pastor, I don't want to control your lives to the point that you can't hear God for yourself. Amen? Amen. And, and here's the thing. You know, you know why we like to control, and I'm done. But the reason that we like to control and manipulate is the reason we're afraid of letting our kids go and our families go and our churches go into the hands of God and letting Him work all that stuff out is when it gets right down to it, I'm going to say something that's going to rattle you, but it's the truth. I mean, right down to the core. When it gets right down to the core, the reason that we have trouble letting go is because we think we make a better God than God. You know what, I've even said this before. No, none of y'all, don't worry, lightning will all strike here. But I've said this before. If I'd have been God, I wouldn't have done it that way. And then a few minutes later, I get the answer. That's why you're not. <laughs> right? Because how you would have done it would have destroyed people. How I did it is leading them by grace to a place where they can change their life. I hope, I hope I'm helping somebody. So God, I, I give you my family and I give you my relationships and, and man, this is a tough one. I, I give you my finances because how many of you want your money to do what you want it to do? But I give you my finances and, and God, I, I give you this church. And... i tell you what, over the last few weeks, Can, can I be vulnerable and honest? And, and then, I want, I want to tell you, because I'm still growing. But back at the end of the year, back at the end of the year, uh, my insurance company called me and told me that at, as of December 31st, they were no longer going to have insurance. You know, I, I was no longer going to be covered. And listen, Listen, <clears throat> I was, you know, paying a, paying a premium for, for insurance, health insurance. And I'm, I'm paying right at $500 a month for health insurance. And so I'm like, how in the world, what do you mean you are leaving? Yeah, we're leaving with all the current changes in current administration in the insurance system and all this. Nobody knows what's going to happen and insurance companies are scared to death so they're pulling out the market. Right now, if you're not covered by a company that you work for in Grayson County, there's not a company in Grayson County that you can buy individual health insurance through in Grayson County. They've completely pulled out of the market. So the best you can have is like a catastrophic plan that doesn't meet all the tax obligations and that you're supposed to do and all that with all these new laws. And they told me that in December and I'm like, or they, they told me a couple months ahead and, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? 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 So let, let me tell you what I, what I did. 
Here's what I did, Alan. I said, I know what I can do. I can, I can go back and drive a school bus. And they'll, they'll pay for my insurance. And so, man, this is tough for me tonight because you know how long I prayed about that? I'm just being real. I got, a, I got a need here. And what I did was I put myself in position of being a better God than God. And I know what I can do. And rather than trusting God to do for me, I jumped out and made a commitment to do something that has now created all kind of chaos in my life because it's taken a lot of my time that I didn't think it would take and I didn't realize how stretched I was and you understand what I'm saying sometimes sometimes even with good intentions right man I hope I'm helping somebody tonight I don't want to try to be a better God than God and what he's shown me over the past few weeks Isaiah 26 3 and 4 I didn't give them this but he said if you'll trust me, Isaiah 26 says, you'll be kept in perfect peace. And I don't know a lot of people who are in perfect peace, but I know a lot of people who are in perfect turmoil, perfect fear, perfect anxiety. But the scripture says he'll keep you in perfect peace, all those who trust in God and all who thought, whose thoughts are fixed on him. And when I'm trying to control my thoughts, they're fixed on what I can do and not on what God can do. And Isaiah said, trust in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. Trust in the Lord. And if I can trust in the Lord, then I don't feel like I have to be in control. Because how many of you know, it's not just people that you can manipulate. You can manipulate situations. And I don't know about you, but I want to begin to draw back the boundaries of my life. I hope by me being vulnerable with you and just telling you a little bit of personal stuff here tonight that you understand that none of us have arrived. This is a journey and we learn as we go. But what, I'm, what I continue to learn over and over and over and over again is that I can't do better for me than what He can. Amen? Draw boundaries in your life. Recognize when people are trying to manipulate you. And pray that God would empower you to set those boundaries the way that they need to be set. Amen? Stand with me tonight. I think what I've done is I've proven I am the most difficult person in the room. People are difficult. And you are difficult for somebody. But if I can learn what God is trying to speak into our lives, then I believe I can walk in greater victory and power than I've ever known before. Amen? Father, I thank you here tonight. I thank you for what you're speaking into our lives. God, I thank you for practical, real things that you're speaking to us. Things that we can take and we can begin to use in our life to set boundaries in our life that will put us more in the direction of what it is that you have desired and preferred for us. Father, I pray for every person in this room, those who are the manipulators and those who have been manipulated, those who are wanting control of everything, and those who recognize, God, that they're being controlled by circumstances that are not your perfect will and design. I just pray that the peace of God that passes understanding would come into our hearts and minds, that you would lead and guide us, that you would open the doors in front of us that no man can shut, and that our lives would be ordered by God, and that we would fulfill the purpose that we were created for. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. And everybody said... Amen.